guys, if we make a bit of a start for our final two wonderful speakers for today. So um, I'm going to um, introduce our next speaker. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome Professor Bryn Baxendale. For those of you that have worked in simulation in the UK for probably the last 15 to 20 years, I'm sure you've heard a lot about Bryn Baxendale with all the pioneering work he's done with both NAMS and then was president of ASPE from 2009. He currently cli clinically practices at Queen's Medical Center here in Nottingham, but also his research interests are all about implementing simulation into healthcare. So it gives us great privilege today to welcome Bryn, who no doubt will stimulate us. Um, thanks, Amanda. No pressure there then. Um, so, uh, well, thanks very much for joining me for, for this session and for the invitation to come and talk to you this afternoon. And, um, uh, yeah, I didn't release a title for this talk um, because I've only just made it. Um, so, because uh, I wasn't quite sure about actually how the talk would fit into the, the flow of the conference and everything. And I think probably that today, this, this for me, might act as a bit of a bridge between today when you've been talking and learning about quite a lot of the new developments and innovations going on from a technological point of view and from an industry perspective through to some of the talks which will feature more heavily tomorrow around application of simulation into uh, healthcare through an educational route or perhaps to try and improve practice. And so I hope that this, although I make relatively little mention of simulation, actually is geared to try and illustrate to you how we are trying to integrate simulation into some of the work we're doing around some of our theatre team's work and perhaps in maternity and some, some other areas of the, of the hospital. Um, there are one or two people in the audience uh, who are from Nottingham, so I shall uh, try not to uh, fib or confabulate too much, uh, but please do uh, challenge me if, uh, if I go too far. Off key. So, um, so yeah. So, I've been in the simulation for quite a bit of time. I'm clinically I'm an anaesthetist at Nottingham University Hospital, which is just down the road. It's across two campuses in the city, quite a large institution, a lot of staff, um, and we've been involved in simulation there since 2004 uh, with the simulation centre. That isn't all of the simulation centre. Looks absolutely massive, doesn't it? Um, but uh, it's actually the postgrad education centre at the QMC campus, and the simulation centre is in. Um, small sort of broom cupboard at the back of it really. Um, that's where we live most of our time and uh, it's a pleasure to see uh, Andy and some others in the room who uh, who were with us at the very beginning of this journey. Um, so o over the past few years we've sort of developed quite a bit in terms of how we've been seeking to apply simulation to help training, help individual staff training around technical procedural skills, technical capabilities bringing in a lot of the work around non-technical skills, more recently focusing a lot more heavily around team training. We've obviously had quite a, a focus through that period, looking at how we develop faculty and enhance educational capacity and capability across the organisation further afield. And down the lower part of the slide starts to illustrate where we've reached in the latter years, which is very much more around developing uh, relationships and networks and collaborations with partners, whether that's with uh, colleagues and uh, see Nick Goslin in the room around some work we've done collaboratively with NHS Blood and Transplant, looking at some of our relationships with the Chartered Institute of Ergonomics, for example, around where we see human factors going in healthcare and how we can support that, if not lead it locally or further afield. And so our mindset around simulation has changed quite a bit over that time. And we are sort of at a time when we're thinking, well, actually, should, should simulation be in the title of the center? Uh, or should it just be an important part of our toolkit or methodology that we seek to apply when we're looking at improving or enhancing individual team case cap capabilities or looking at improving healthcare systems and design and improvement work? So, so that's a bit about us, really. Um, now, <coughs> here we are. Um, I thought let's spend a bit of time talking about the simulation. Actually, are we using it for or what we actually need rather than what we want to do? Because we have to mature. We have to move forward and saying, actually, um, there's quite a bit of time spent on developing resource, spending time doing it. And yes, we can do that around things which actually we find quite fun. Or we can start to tackle some of the help tackle some of the trickier problems. 
what you don't need from me is to get onto these vindaloo sausage rolls in the reception this evening. I can tell you that. that uh, if you want me to make you some, I will do. Um, but so the difference between what we need and what we want, and how do we identify that? How do we develop and design our work and then demonstrate that we're achieving something around that value at an organisational level or at a local level? And we centre a lot of our work around saying, well, actually, what is the quality of healthcare? How do we define quality healthcare? And looking at these key principles around patient safety or effectiveness of care and outcomes or staff well-being or perhaps around productivity and efficiency. And I think when you talk to staff, staff focus quite, it's quite an easy, it's an easier message to say, actually, well, let's look at patient safety, and this is why simulation is important. It's been a relationship that's been out there for a number of years. It's uh, a, an easier discussion to have about saying, well, we'll help actually make care safer if we engage in this activity. Actually, staff are also worried about outcomes. They want to look after the patients as best they can. And to an extent, they like to think they look after each other. We like to think we pay attention to staff well-being, but we're not perhaps quite as focused on that. We're very externally focused looking after the patients. We don't necessarily look after ourselves quite as well as we could do in practice. And we're staff tend to be slightly less sighted of productivity and efficiency, despite all of the attention that's being paid to that in our healthcare system anyway. If you look at it from the manager's perspective, of course, you see a slightly different focus. Very, very heavily invested in looking at where the money's going, how it's being spent, how do we spend our resource wisely. Obviously interested in outcomes, to an extent, also interested in staff well-being, although perhaps from a different perspective, and interested in patient safety, but actually not necessarily to the same value as having to look after the money in the system, because actually that is a big, big, big bottom line. So you'll see that actually the two Venn diagrams sort of overlap quite a lot, but they're not exactly the same. So when we're talking about demonstrating value from the simulation work that we're trying to improve, we need to think very carefully about the message and who we're delivering it to and what their take home is about actually, well, where's the value for the bit that I'm really responsible for? And just being sort of wise to the fact that they're not always aligned, even if we'd like to think that they are. So what have we been doing? Well, <coughs> we've been looking at it from a safety perspective in theatres. And this is quite an interesting model put out by um, Charles Vincent Rennie Alma Berti in a, a, an open access uh, book, actually, that you can get um, from a year or two ago, which looks about reconsidering safety and reconsidering safety in healthcare and draw some interesting parallels with some other industries. And we talk about, there's a lot of talk, isn't there, about healthcare and wanting to be high reliability and uh, ultra safe and stuff like that. And I, I say, well, actually, that's a very nice ambition, but actually it's not always achievable. So some industries, aviation is probably a good example, are high reliability, ultra safe. So they basically are very, very procedurally driven in terms of standard operating procedures, policies, protocols. Uh, sort of delight, delights me to know every time I'm going on holiday that actually uh, an air crew don't set out to take risks. I'd be a bit worried about getting on that airline if they did. Um, if the weather is a little bit dodgy in the airport where you're going to, they don't tend to take off and let's say, let's see how it is when we get there and say, oh, well, we'll wait. If there's one person missing on the airline, uh, they don't say, well, well, we'll set off anyway. They say, oh, no, we're waiting now. Uh, can you imagine if we had NHS air, what that would look like? <laughs> probably wouldn't look like that, would it? It would probably be, uh, well, yeah, the captain's coming. He's not here yet, but we'll crack on. Uh, we haven't quite sorted the route out yet. Um, and uh, if anyone's got their uh, mobile phones on in the cabin, if they could just check the route on Google and uh, come and give us some advice whilst we're on the way, that'll be fine. And, uh, well, we'll see where we get to. We're not quite sure how much petrol we've got either. But anyway, it'll be all right. It'll be fine. We'll probably be okay. Oh, and we have to change crews halfway, by the way. Um, so uh, if anyone can fly, let us know. Because uh, you'll be on. So, so uh, yeah, the NHS doesn't quite work in that ultra-safe end, does it? The other end of the spectrum is perhaps the world of the sort of deep sea trawler, North Sea fishing, high risk every day. Every day they'll go out, they're potentially confronted with circumstances that might challenge their lives. <coughs> Success for them is about coming home uh, at the end of a trip out, hopefully with some fish to sell. 
uh, and uh, not injured, uh, and they can go out and do it again the next day. They don't live in a world that's got rules, regulations, policies, protocols, a big, thick book to look through for any given circumstance because they're confronted by circumstances that tend to be fairly unique. So they work to actually work together very, very adaptively to suit and meet the demands of the situation that they face, usually successfully. Success for them is coming home alive and actually being able to do that again the next day. Now that's interesting, isn't it? So healthcare has got a bit of that in our environment anyway, in hospital, in acute teaching hospital, we've got a bit of that. We have um, situations where you are confronted by needing to respond to things which haven't necessarily been written out in a textbook uh, and described in a video. So we have to adapt. We have to adapt. So this is sort of the world of heroes and it's the sort of world where people who like to wear their underpants outside their trousers, they like this. They enjoy it. Now, this is interesting, isn't it? If you take that person and say, actually, what we're going to do with you now is uh, we're going to do some work where you need to sit at the other end of the spectrum and follow the rules. They really don't like that. They're not very comfortable. And vice versa. If you like following the rules, you're not very comfortable in an environment where actually there aren't any rules. Very, very uncomfortable. Most of the time, I would suggest we probably sit in the middle between those two. The, the, the picture describes firefighters as a... As an example, I think healthcare has probably got a lot of similarities in that you know what work you've got to do. You know more or less what that's going to entail, but you don't know exactly how it's going to present itself. The circumstances around you might vary. The people with whom you're working might not be the same. Uh, the resource you've got available to you might not be exactly as you would wish. So you have to adapt. So the work in the middle is about training to be able to adapt. It is about having that flexibility, that adaptability, it's having the skill set that says actually we can look after each other and actually we will cope and we will perhaps work around the boundaries of some of the rules and policies and protocols to enable us to do that. It's quite an interesting contrast uh, to perhaps what we think by high reliability. So we know we have to work around that. Now, the problem we have in healthcare, I suspect, is that in firefighting, fortunately, most of the time, they're not out fighting fires. So they spend quite a bit training. In healthcare, we spend all our time working. And you get someone out to try and do some training, that's quite hard work sometimes, especially as a team. So there's the challenge. There's the challenge. How do we do that? Um, it's set in the context of error and harm, which is increasingly being highlighted professionally and politically as a public health issue. So yes, we can use that as a driver to help us develop the work that we want to do around safety and safety improvement, but it's actually a key issue that actually surrounds us all the time. So we need to find some solutions to this. We need to work quite smartly to think, how are we going to address this? Because actually it's a big issue, a very, very big issue that we need to confront. We live in a world where actually we spend most of our time perhaps just bending the rules because the rules don't always apply. And that's fine when it goes okay, but if it doesn't okay, doesn't go okay and harm arises or even um, avoidable harm or death, there tends to be quite intense scrutiny on what was going on. And an initial level of that scrutiny can be, why didn't you follow the policy? Why didn't you just follow? We got procedures for this. Why didn't you do it? So we lose sight of the context that actually our teams, our staff, you, me, are using in the moment to adapt to what seemed to make sense at the time, but in the cold light of day, in retrospect, might not look quite such an easy thing to describe or to defend. So it's really important that we understand, okay, well, we're bending rules. Now, it's interesting. Some of this talk I, I gave to uh, a European aviation safety manager conference and they are approaching healthcare to understand how do we develop adaptability in our training for our flight crews because actually following the rules all the time isn't quite what they always want and they know that flight crews bend the rules occasionally about landings and they know that there's a certain latitude to actually how 
their crews will respond to certain situations, but they need to understand, they're trying to understand, well, how do we build that into our training? What's an acceptable level? And uh, they were quite interested because obviously we spend a lot of our time working outside the rules and occasionally coming across them and putting them into practice uh, under our circumstances. So there's a very interesting dialogue developing actually between healthcare and aviation. Right, so what does this look like in surgical care? So this is a traditional model about how we look after quality in surgical care. Um, and we have a number of um, outcomes in that box down the right which looks at some of those things that were in the little bubbles at the beginning in terms of effectiveness of outcomes, complications, uh, patient experience, uh, productivity and efficiency. Uh, there might be a little bit around staff well-being or recruitment and retention. But those tend to be the data about getting the work done that gets monitored. And that data is then sort of um, analysed and uh, considered by usually senior staff, sometimes clinical, sometimes non-clinical. And uh, they then feed that back down to the teams, sometimes who are directly involved in patient care, sometimes the support teams, to say, this is what we need to do to make this work better. Which usually translates to pedal a bit harder. Pedal a bit harder, uh, uh, and you've got a bit less time to do it. And can you not make any mistakes, please? And follow the procedures, follow the protocols. Oh, well, you made a mistake there. We'll rewrite that policy. So th it's done away from the coal face, if you like. So you see there's a problem here about actually how do the teams, how do the people delivering the care actually translate that into, well, what can we do now to improve the quality of care? How does that data get fed back in and offer something meaningful at a local or an organisational level? And a lot of it tends to be retrospective. So a lot of it tends to be looking at past performance. So our outcomes data or our incident data or whatever else will tell you what we did in the last three months, what we did in the last six months. It's not necessarily terribly predictive about what we're going to do next month or in the next three months. It's not necessarily very predictive about helping us understand, well, if we change this service or if we change the environment in which this work's being done or the nature of how people are populating our shifts, what does this mean about actually the quality of care that's going to be delivered? Because we don't quite have the data to really interpret it in that way. Because uh, we're not like other industries, we've never really collected data in that fashion. And we know that if you look at teamwork and actually the processes of work that's done in teams, those of you who work in teams, you'll probably be familiar with how often we look at day-to-day -day practice and debrief that don't quite capture it. We just accept it as, well, that's how we work. And we will only debrief if something bad has gone wrong. And then we'll focus on it quite a lot. Whereas actually, we need to understand a lot more about day-to-day -day work because most of the time we're getting it right. So actually, there's a lot to understand about how we adapt in day-to-day -day practice, which we sort of just take for granted. But we need to develop the skills and create the opportunities for us to capture that information. Theatres, resource constrained. We work in teams, some of whom are familiar with one another, often not, working across a care pathway where your team is distributed, so you're not necessarily sighted of one another. Ward, well, admission process, ward, um, bringing the patient to theatre, coming through theatre, into recovery, out into a ward environment or a critical care environment. Many, many different teams, and many, many areas where actually the interplay between those teams uh, isn't necessarily quite as smooth or as collaborative as it could be uh, because we tend to work in our bubbles. So there's a problem about how we develop and challenge that. Increasingly, we see patient, patient experience, patient expectations, individualised care becoming more important. So actually, for us to then have to adapt and acknowledge that is really important. Um, but sort of use the phrase on some of our team training programs about patients coming through theatres and for the theatre teams uh, this is just a routine day at work. For the patient coming through it might be the most important day of their lives. So we have to bridge that gap as well and just keep that current in, in our minds when we're looking after patients. And we need to think about well how do we actually develop an opportunity to train teams and actually let them develop the skills, demonstrate the abilities to meet certain challenges, some of which are predictable, some of which may be unpredictable and infrequent. And so we have a look at this. Well, actually, traditionally, we've always looked at individual practice, haven't we? We develop as individuals, we train as individuals, we develop curricula uh, in uh, isolation, 
we provide relatively few opportunities to understand how we work together and train together and look at those principles around team working, but we expect that to be applied as if by some magic dust has been brushed on us to say, actually, in the, in the work setting, then you're all going to work together and it's going to be fine. And the problem is, okay, some of the time it is, some of the time it isn't. So it's a problem, it's a model. We also know that actually the conditions in which we're working, uh, your true systems design piece about how we are working, what equipment we're interacting with, the environment, uh, how work is organized, influences performance quite significantly. Yet we don't tend to pay that much attention to that in our training. We just train people, drop them in, expect them to perform. Problem, if they don't, that tends to center back on them as an individual. But actually, it might not be them at all. It might be the environment, it might be the climate of that team, it might be the conditions under which that team's working. Actually, makes it very difficult to develop and perform. So the program we've been putting together is to say, well, actually, how do we address that? How do we address that at a person level, people level? How do we address that at a system level and do that in parallel? And that's what I'm going to describe to you in the next few minutes because we've um, spent some time adapting, taking a, a team steps model. You'll recognize that as a team steps model, those of you that look at team training, and thinking about these key principles that underpin effective team performance where there's an evidence base around leadership, so designated leadership as well as situational leadership, around effective communication, around mutual support. So actually, how do we really uh, support one another in the moment? challenge one another when we think actually we're perhaps we're not quite doing the right thing? How do we develop and maintain shared mental models across a team and sustain them in a dynamic work environment and have a shared mental model that can work for a team that's working with each other physically as well as across a pathway where we're not face to face? How do we develop that? Because actually these are the principles by which we work effectively and there's a good evidence base for that. And the program has got a range of tools and strategies that will help address what I've described in that left-hand column there under barriers. Actually, if you look down the left-hand column, you'll recognize a number of facets of day-to-day uh, -day life, really, about working in healthcare that we all come across and we all confront. And I think we know that actually on a good day, we'll be pretty good at overcoming some of those barriers and doing a good day's work and being safe with the patients and looking after each other. But actually, do we do it each day, every day? No. And so that's when it creates a problem. But this program has actually got a range of tools and techniques in it, which we're sort of translating a little bit from U US into UK speak. But actually, some of those tools and techniques are familiar to our teams, some of them less so. They are skills and behaviors, so they have to be practiced. It's not like all of a sudden you pick it up and it'll work wonderfully. So we know we have to rehearse them. And actually that is the way in which we will actually get to a position whereby the teams delivering care will display some of these effective team working capabilities, attributes that will support them under different circumstances and under different challenges. And will work whether they are a team that works at that towards that left-hand edge of the ultra-safe end, or will work if they're a team that has to work in the North Sea, deep sea trawler end. Because actually the tools can be applied to the context of the work being done by that team. <laughs> so what we need to then work out is, okay, well actually if we're gonna put those skills into practice, what, what's gonna tell us actually that the staff are in the best position to apply those skills? So we need to have some idea that they've acquired some of the knowledge against a level or a standard because some of these things we, you know people we haven't talked about team training to staff very much at all it's always new it has enormous face validity when you put the program in front of people they say well this is just what we need um, so we need to think about okay well have we got it do we need to go through some of those principles again but more interestingly for us I think we need to really think hard and scrutinize about what is it that then influences the ability and the likelihood of those staff to display those skills and behaviors in practice. What is it that will actually help them understand this is the right time to try this tool or to try this technique or test it out? Actually, am I gonna do it? What's getting in the way of me doing it if I'm a little bit anxious about that? And then think about developing some targeted support to help people just take those steps. 
So we're looking at a system which uses situational judgment responses. Now, some of you in education may have come across these used in undergraduate or pre-reg level, I think a lot around selection work. We're looking at these to develop these for some of the safety skills and behaviors in the Teams program, uh, which actually allow you to, in that top box, this is an example not from our program, so it's not quite as tense to get the detail, but in the top box you create a situation, you describe a scenario, and then you have a number of responses beneath it. And the person looking at this is then asked to say, well, okay, considering the situation you've described, imagine you were in that position, uh, which of these responses do you think is right or wrong? And how confident are you in your answer? So we're validating some of these questions now for theatre staff and for maternity staff, because actually this starts to give us a, an predictive indicator of likelihood to apply some of these skills and behaviours in practice. Because once somebody's gone through the program, they get a report back straight away. And the report back to them says, well, actually, look, this is how you did against you know, what we think are the right answers. This is how you did that blue bar uh, up to a standard, which we need to set that standard. Um, and an interesting philosophical question about what should the standard be if it's about safety skills and behaviours. You know, perhaps it should be 100%. I don't know. Anyway, how do you do knowledge-wise? And the little orange dot, and you can see it, gives you an indication of how confident they are in their answers. Now, um, you'll see down the right-hand column, it's like a green star, there's a yellow uh, symbol, and there's one red symbol. So the yellow symbol tends to flag up when somebody's developed a level of knowledge but which could be improved, so their understanding could be improved. Um, the red tends to be when their understanding might need to be improved significantly, but they're very confident in their knowledge. Ah, see where I'm going, right. <laughs> so you get this sort of matrix, don't you? So that box, bottom left-hand side, I'm a boy, I'm going to describe colours that might not tune in with everybody's description of these colours. The sort of amber box in the bottom left, big one. Um, there's an area where actually if you're new to an area of work or uh, you're a novice coming into practice, you might expect levels of knowledge to be a bit lower than a certain standard. You'd expect confidence to be a bit lower and you think, well, actually, I'm not quite sure. So they know, they sort of know what they, they don't know, really. Um, as you move up and you get more experience and you've improved your knowledge, you go into the yellow section and there you're improving your knowledge, your confidence might still need some support, but actually you might not need pointing at further education and training. You might need just some support in practice around supervision, a bit of coaching, or an opportunity to rehearse those skills if they're done infrequently, so you can get a feel for what it's like doing it. And you need to be helped by or have access to seeing some role models who are good at doing it. Top box in the green, you've got people with decent knowledge still building on their confidence to the top right, where actually you've got people who are very confident and they've got the knowledge and so these are actually probably your ideal role models. They've got it, they can do it. Now those role models might not be the people you expect. They might be somebody who's quite uh, one of the non-registered members of the, of the team. But actually they see how the team works, they understand what to do. They might be uh, a new uh, member of the team and actually they've got the knowledge and skills and actually they can role model to others. So they need to be supported still. You'll notice the bottom right hand box I haven't touched on just yet. These are the people with perhaps lower levels of knowledge or understanding that we might want, but actually they're very confident. Now the problem here is if you identify one or two people in this area and they're very experienced or senior or they've been in the team for a long time, they can influence a lot of other people in the team. And they can influence people not necessarily to do the right thing. So that's a different conversation to have with them. It's a different discussion to understand why their answers ended up putting them in that position. Now, we're not saying this is a performance measure. This is very much around helping us understand what we need to discuss with individuals to help them develop. And actually, somebody who perhaps ended up in that box might have a really valid perspective on the responses that ended up giving them a red rating, in which case that's really useful to discuss because healthcare complex, dynamic, it's not always right and wrong, there are judgments to make, but it creates the opportunity for that conversation. So this is the tool that we're actually developing and applying 
the response back to the individual not, doesn't just give you the bar graph. Actually, it gives you some indicators about what the rationale is behind those answers if you want to look at it. So you can argue about it. That's fine. It also gives you this. It gives you this as well, actually. It starts to give you links to learning. So actually, when you've had your answers and you've looked at a particular topic, you then get a link down saying, actually, well, if you want to find out a bit more about this, here are some resources you can go and look at. And we need to populate that platform such that people can access that quite easily. It might be something to read. It might be a video to watch or a podcast to listen to. It might be um, uh, a conversation to have with a colleague or one of our people who are in that sort of talent, top talent pool. I don't know, a team leader. So it gives you those links to learning. And I think simulation obviously provides a great opportunity as one of those opportunities to rehearse or train or develop some of those skills if we populate them. And actually now we can start to say, well, here's a little exercise we can do using simulation. Here we've got the group who do simulation in your environment, in your locality. Actually, they could put on a little exercise for you to practice that if you want to. So actually, it makes it easy for people to go back and develop. And they can demonstrate that they've done it as well. So for their appraisals, they've got this record and they say, yeah, and I've done that and I've accessed this and this is where I am now. So it's a, it's a much easier process for us to target an individual about how they develop. If you look at now at the service level support, so if we do this across a specialty team or across an area of practice, now you can start to get a bit of a, a grid that gives you a, a broader profile of how people working in your area, it might be a ward, it might be a theatre team, it might be a different area of practice, uh, what the range is like across that professional community, across that staff group. Now here you can start to see, obviously, now, if I'm a manager or if I'm uh, perhaps an education provider, we can think about, okay, well, what shall we concentrate on to develop resources now that are going to meet the needs of your staff groups? And we can see that actually whatever topics those were under C, D, and G, we say, okay, that's what we need to concentrate on for the next three months, next six months. And actually, we're going to concentrate on accessing that. And actually, the staff who have demonstrated that need, you've got a better idea of whether they're going to access this, if we're going to make it easy for them to access it, whether they need to come out of work to do a bit of that, and we can demonstrate improvement against those markers. So you're starting to see we don't need to provide education and training for everybody as a sheep dip. We can start to target it to specific groups, specific individuals where it's most needed. And if you're running the organisation, then you get a picture which says actually there are a few reds on here. Some of those align with some pretty hot topics that we know our commissioners or our regulators are going to come in and ask about because it comes up in our never, never event reports or whatever else it is that they come to look at. Now you can give me assurances internally about actually how are we addressing those needs so that I've got an answer. And we'll have evidence of whether that strategy of what we put in place is succeeding or not. And if it's not succeeding, we've got evidence of that so that we can adapt it and we can change it. So this whole program now starts to integrate some of the offers that we were put in place in a more, um, in a more targeted or focused fashion. We know that it's not just knowledge uh, and ability to apply skills that's going to be important. We've got some teamwork climate measures that we can put in place. We can look at some of those um, metrics in a little bit more detail about, okay, what is it like to work in this team? Uh, what is your interaction like with those who are managing the team? Or what are the conditions like in the department where you're working that may give, get in the way of you demonstrating these skills and behaviours? So again, that gives us another metric to look at in terms of developing the ability to perform optimally, to work effectively in teams, to deliver safer to care. Um, the platform has go, goes deeper than that because actually, we haven't got to this bit yet, but this is the direction of travel. You can see now, not only will we do some education training, we'll do some targeted training or targeted support coaching. We can do some uh, simulated practice or we can observe real practice. We can look at debriefing data to start to help a team understand their performance and their ability to adapt to different challenges and that this will look different for 
had it there, I would say this would look different for a cardiac team from a day case team. But actually, it's really relevant for them because actually now they, as a team, can start to pick up on saying, well, actually, for us, these are some of the bits which we think are really important and this is what we need. And actually now we can actually say, well, we can probably help develop an ability to respond to that need. So more lead indicators than retrospective indicators. Integrating simulation into the educational piece, but also in terms of the improvement piece at the top end. And actually engaging the teams, hopefully engaging the teams more actively in trying to improve the quality of work and giving them the opportunity to improve the quality of work that they're delivering and understanding what that looks like at an organizational level. And for those leading the organization or managing to understand very much what it looks like at the level of delivery of care, where I think we've perhaps not always uh, shared that um, as, as optimally as we could do. Our program, we're, we've got quite a big improvement program going on in the trust. Um, which has got this sort of phases of support um, described along the bottom. And you'll see that this, 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 program, this is not a quick win. This is not a quick win. This is actually a staged 